And we're good. Okay. And we're back again for the 15th time. <laughs> yep. I'm not even going to do my Oklahoma play Ains joke. It was just windy. I always... I do that joke um, not all the work. time, but on the occasion whenever it is windy and... You know the, the 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 damn the damn jokes in the song. The damn joke. But welcome back, everybody. To Tall and short with Tim and Tony. This is like what take five on trying to just do the damn intro. Right. You know technical difficulties. No big deal. Yep. Just um, technical difficulties, locational difficulties, a whole bunch of personal <laughs> staff issues, cat issues, and. Wait, are we calling my child and our cat and your cats the staff? <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Uh, I don't feel like paying my kid this kind of money. <laughs> what, what money? What exactly. money? <laughs> this is this, most This is a this is a charitable donation system and um we're the charity. Yeah, and we're the charity. <laughs> Where's the money go to? Us. What's the charity? In my belly. The Tall and Short Fund that goes to make sure that... <clears throat> I don't even have anything. I'm starting to get ideas. i got to stop getting ideas. Yeah, probably I don't feel this is turning into a not good idea. Now, anyway, welcome back, everybody, once again to another episode of Tall and Short with Tim and Tony. That's a Tim. And that's a Tony. And we're not doing the Italian joke again. I might go, I might have got back. All uh, right, well... Okay, we'll do like a, a behind the scenes episode. And we just tell tell all the jokes that didn't make it into the cut. That wouldn't surprise me. Well, I mean, we there's so many we could have done. But a la vie. A lot of bad jokes. A lot of bad jokes that would get kicked off there. Very. Mostly you. Racist bastard. Oh, <laughs> oh, don't pull that out. do not put that out into the world. No. Tim's a very good person. He's just short and angry. Shut up. I rest my case. Shut up. <laughs> anyway, today, Tony, finally, we're going to be talking, finally, let's get this right, we're talking right. about an, an, something that is quintessentially Australian. Do you want to have a guess? So it's poisonous or venomous, and it's probably going to kill you within 30 seconds of looking at it, so... Australia... I mean, Australia is Australia, but... Now. I mean, what else could it be that's venomous and or poisonous and could probably kill you within 30 seconds? I mean, it... You sound like you're talking about my ex. All right, then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've met your ex. No, I don't think I met that one. Oh, no, not that one. No, no, no. I've met some of your exes. Let's <laughs> not work. Nah. I'm Let's talk... delve into Tim's dating history. Let's this not. This is the episode. <laughs> I've got a better one. Instead of my dating life, which is not impressive at all, let's just talk about the Great Emu War. And that sounds made up. Nope, and it's... Like your dating life. Ah, bazinga. Ow. Oh. <laughs> there goes... My... Sad, I'm... My... sad crocodile noises. Mm. <laughs> But yes, emu war. It's man versus giant dinosaur bird things. Mammal versus that bird. That sounds very Australian. Yeah, this is something that's quintessentially Australian. And Crikey, this... what are you guys fighting? Emu. And what? this this gets a little uh this let's gets a little Looney Tunes. It's Australia. Obviously, it's gonna get a loony, little Looney Tunes. Oh, it, j just just wait. It's gonna be. It, you're gonna have a time here. So, all right. I'm going to set up some background right now. Hopefully all everybody right. loved all that ASMR of you having to reach up and uh, get stuff. <laughs> yep, all over the place. All right. After World War One, much like many other locations that have, you know, that sent out troops to fight, Australia had a lot of veterans returning. From the numbers I could find, it said roughly, it was roughly, uh, you know, quarter of a million, so 250,000 people yeah. returning. Yeah. Those that, you know, returned alive, I would argue. I'm not going to get, not going <laughs> to delve into that number. Let's talk about something even more depressing, war deaths. Ah, uh, yeah. These veterans were given land throughout Australia via a soldier settlement system, or a scheme, and 
I, the word scheme, <laughs> the word, the word scheme, it has that connotation of being nefarious and like the classic Snidely whiplash, just, just, uh, you know, uh, r uh, wringing his hand, just like, yes, finally, but <laughs> finally I will get you. Oh God. What's so you got Snidely whiplash. You had it right. Yeah. The Canadian Mountie cartoon. Oh, uh, Dudley do right. Dudley do right. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's not the whiplash. <laughs> Uh, uh, this was to help with the life livelihood, as well as you know a nice little gift or reward for their service, like how we do the GI Bill here in yeah. the United States, just to you know, help them get back on their feet. Yeah, I mean that's pretty <laughs> free land. I can't complain about that. Well, you could if you wanted to, but free land's free land. One thing I did find is that uh, apparently they couldn't pick where they wanted to go they were kind of oh. told to go they were kind of told to go to their places yeah that sounds that there's the other shoe yeah that's not good freeland where at we'll tell you middle of australia we'll tell you uh. roughly 23.2 million acres of land had been allotted for a little over 2300 farms in australia so now, not everybody became a farmer or that sort of thing, but... I mean, what sort of farm in... I mean, I've seen pictures of Australia. There's rocks and dirt. Funny enough, there's actually like a... Texas. Funny enough, there's actually a location that we're going to be in today. In Western Australia, which is on the far end, it's where our story takes place. It has over... It had over 9 million acres of land allotted with... 1,095 farms on it. Jesus. So, good chunk of change out there for people. No joke. Western Australia has the Wheat Belt, which sent you a photo. Yeah. It takes place... It's a. It's in the <clears throat> southwestern chunk of Australia. I don't... Crikey. <laughs> I don't see... Why would Australia have a wheat belt? I don't know. That doesn't make sense. That's like saying, yeah, Oklahoma, we have a professional football team. Oh, wait, no, we don't. Well, I mean, it's an export. Plus, the thing is, you got to grind That's... up everything. It was a good, it was a, it's now a much better, I think, agricultural location than it I'm was sure back it then. Because this yeah. is back in the 19, this is back in like the 1920s and 30s oh, that we're going to be in. So Yeah, Great Depression. And, so think yeah. about, so think about how like probably farming techniques were not nearly as good back then as they are now. Yeah. But I mean, they didn't have John Deere's. That too. <laughs> But a good chunk of this land is ideal for agricultural growing, which is what they would do for wheat and various other yeah. stuff. Not to mention, uh, the further eastern you go in the wheat belt, so a bit more further inland. Yeah. Uh, good for raising sheep. Yeah, yeah, I forget they do sheep. Lots of sheep. I forget they have a, yeah, a boatload of sheep. In fact, this area, the wheat belt, it makes up for nearly two-thirds of Western Australia's wheat. Which is, Jesus. that is a lot of wheat. 1929, the looming Great Depression proved to be quite the threat, obviously. obviously. Starting in the United States and then just expanding to the rest of the world, Australian farmers were encouraged, air quotes, to increase their crop, and they would promise to be paid in subsidies by the Australian government, which... Uh, yeah, that's a... I, I trust that statement. <laughs> yeah. The promises were not delivered upon, which no. would be... I definitely would be pretty duped. I'd be upset if and... that happened. Now, somebody who's never who's never held an agricultural background, yeah, I'd be upset as hell. I mean, just from the small... Because we had a hobby farm. We raised longhorns and we uh, cut and baled our own hay. So it was very much... Um, self-sustaining for ourselves. Yeah. But if we had overflow, or if we had an extra cut of hay that we could get in before the season ended, um, we'd sell a couple bales. And I mean, you've seen round bales. You've seen how big they are. Yeah. Fifty to one hundred and fifty a pop. Damn. I mean, that's nowadays that that's like a tank of gas anymore. But yeah, know, back in two thousand ten range that was still. 
tank of gas, a good dinner, and you could get a couple bags of feed on just a bale of hay. So nice. I mean that that in itself is yeah that would that just one bale would piss me off. <laughs> let alone you know a whole season's worth. I can imagine. But October 1932. The farmers said that they would harvest the wheat, and this has been like going on for four years now, by the way. Oh, yeah. But they wouldn't deliver it. They threatened the non-delivery because, you know, they're duped by the government. It's like, we did our side of the job. Do yours. Mm-hmm. I mean, ain't that... Wait, the, the government did its job? Mm. Immediately when suspicious. When you're the only one in the group doing all the work. <laughs> there's a deep cut yeah that's a conversation that's a between the lines episode <laughs> on top of their government not helping these farmers who were again former soldiers mm -hmm. in the weed belt had another problem emus Emu? specifically 20,000 emus Tony's eyes just got big at the number. That is a lot of uh, deep fried chicken leg. Yeah, that's a lot of Macca's that's, nuggets. That's a lot of yeah, that's a lot of McNuggets. They call them Macca's down there, not McDonald's. Have some Macca's. All right, listen, Dundee. <laughs> I got I got a couple friends in Australia, so yeah, we have a couple listeners in Australia. Probably yeah. not after this episode, but you know. <laughs> Now, I'm going to talk about emus for a second because you know, some old dude in the past said, Know thy enemy. So, might as well learn about the emus, the enemy, that we have to go against. Dromaeus Nove Hollandi, or the emu. That's well, their. You do you too. That's their. Uh, Hollandaise. Ooh, now I want food. Now I'm hungry. Sauce? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> the emu is the second largest bird in the world after the common ostrich. Should be no surprise. Emus have a height between 150 to 190 centimeters, which is between 5 feet to 6 foot 3 in For height. For American listeners. <laughs> I, I, do, I go between... I do freedom units and then metric units, so we're good there. <laughs> we... We we scale it by America and by the rest of you communists. <laughs> Considering our respective heights, Tony, these birds range in between From me to you. Yeah, which that's terrifying. Almost literally, like almost to a T. Yeah. I'm How just about to spell museum. Jesus. M U S E U M. Shut up. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I have very little issue spelling words most of the time. He do words good. I do words goods. I don't say words goods, but I spell words goods. Except museum, <laughs> apparently. Adult emus can weigh an average of roughly 76 pounds. But they can weigh more, sometimes up to 120 pounds. Now I'm about 160, so... I'm a little heavier than an emu. <laughs> What are you giggling at? I, wasn't, I would side rail so hard. It, it was going to be a penis joke. <laughs> Just going to be a dick joke. I'm low-hanging fruit shooting here. Fair enough. Female emus are a little larger than male emus, which that's standard, standard for most animal species. Have, you know, I mean, they're fucking dinosaurs. Yeah, so. pretty much. I mean, these things, are, these things are legitimately from the dinosaur period. They look like it, and they... Act like it too. Just do that one again. <laughs> God, I, I I need you to record that, and so we can make that a gif <laughs> or a gif for you communists. <laughs> it is gif. I will die on this hill. I will also die with you on this hill. Emus have long, thin necks that are pale blue with sparse dark down feathers, like nothing major, like. Dark, still little like dark feathers on them. Large bodies with grayish brown shaggy plumage, and long ass legs that are good for running. If you look up an emu, it's a very obvious animal to what we are talking about. Boop. 
gonna send you an emu photo because we need emu photos. Emu? You ought to just put a cassowary, an emu, and a moa <clears throat> in there and just see how many people can guess the right which one it is. I mean, if you can find a photo, I know you will. Emus have excellent vision and hearing, so... Just like me, except no. no. Mm, that's debatable. All right. They can scatter when needed, so they can see you coming like, eh. They'll either go run or... I'm gonna fuck that up. Or just back to eating. They're, they're birds. They yeah, also... they're Australian, so the, the chance of you fighting an emu... The chance in a fight, eh? I'm gonna go in and out of that accent. Not often. Yeah, please please stay out of it <laughs> as much as possible. I've pissed the French off, you can piss the Australians off. They also have... Emus also have vestigial wings, making them unable to fly. Yep. They, they get, their, their wings are like eight inches long, so roughly... So roughly about here. About the size... My literally about the size... About the size of my, about the size of my armor, uh, cocked up into something here. <laughs> I couldn't say it any other way, like done up in a, do a bird arm, like do how a bird would stand. That's how big an emu's wing <gasps> is. Whenever they run, they will actually like so flop do, them. Like ostriches and they'll, they'll flop, them. they'll flop them out while they run, and it's goofy as all hell, because it's like that little. Little neck just uh, looks like a Muppet walking around. <laughs> I am breaking you today. You just you're saying weird things and doing weird things, and it's just bizarre. And I'm confused. How long have we been friends? I don't feel like talking about how old I feel today. <laughs> Their legs end in three-toed claws, five-inch claws, I should say which are used for defense against opponents. Mostly, if, you know, someone, you know, prey, predators try to come up, kick them. So, kickbox, champ kickbox champions here. I'm gonna let you have that one. Their walking stride is roughly three feet, at a three feet, or about one meter for walking distance, yeah. while their running stride is roughly nine feet. Or 2.75 meters. That's a me and you combined. So that, yeah, they get a good run in. You th I thought I had little legs. No, these things make you have little legs. They can also run up to 30 miles per hour. Jesus. Thanks to them being the only birds in the world to have calf muscles. That's not terrifying. Mm-hmm. All other birds have, like, you know, thighs and that's like, thigh muscles and sort of thing. Yeah. These birds have calf muscles. They have lower leg <clears throat> muscles. Which, that's terrifying. Go ahead. That was the, I was like, I would think a cassowary, but... Yeah, I can see an emu having... Yeah. Thigh muscles. Jeez. Yeah, they're good. They are... Fa they are faster, just slightly faster than Usain Bolt. Who what? He made like twenty seven miles an hour when he I think he was running twenty nine point twelve. Something around that margin. Yeah. He, it was high twenties for him. So basically the fastest man in the world can still not outrun giant murder bird. He could try. He could it would probably be like literally a a screen finish. A, a snapshot. A, yeah. That's it. There's the word. Emus It's gonna be a long episode. We're <laughs> Nah, we're doing all I right. Can't spell museum. You can't say snapshot. It's great. That's it. It's emus, great. emus primarily eat plants like fruits, and that sort of thing, but they will occasionally eat, you know, insects and other bugs. I wouldn't surprise me they would eat small rodents and stuff if they wanted extra protein. I mean, I mean, we know cows in Australia eat snakes. They so. need the got to get that protein. <laughs> so. Why wouldn't the giant bird do it? They'll also swallow stones to help with... Small stones yeah. to help with digestion. That's a dinosaur thing. Yep. <laughs> Emus also infrequently drink water. They will mostly drink a lot the of it. The blood of the innocent what? Hmm? What? Say it. The blood of the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> they will drink copious amounts of water at least once a day. We're talking full-on camel drinking, and then yeah. they'll just... That's they'll why... do exactly, and they'll camel, they'll camel hump it. I think this is why they're so stupid. They're dehydrated. That doesn't explain you, though. 
I'm not saying anything. Are you drinking enough water? (laughs) I am. I have mine next to me. Anyway. They lay these large, dark green eggs. I have seen those. Turns out, turns out, apparently, they, they, they're, not, they're not as dark as when they're first hatched. They're like a, a paler, I think. And then as they get, as they get, oh, uh, as the eggs age in the incubation process, they get darker. Or if Daenerys Targaryen takes them into the fire. They, yeah, that that's too. Exact, that's how you they get... They look like goddamn dragon eggs. That's how you get them. Oh, absolutely. And they're roughly about five to six inches in length, so they're a good sizable egg. So if you ever want to brag to a lady at the bar, I'm about the size of an emu egg. <laughs> <clears throat> all right all right we, americans will measure anything in any sort except the metric system so how yep one egg one emu egg <laughs> one, one dinklage <laughs> there's a there's oh, oh god we're the eggs are <laughs> eggs are laying i get us back on track <clears throat> Eggs are laying in clutches of 5 to 15 Jesus. eggs. That's a lot of eggs. That poor female emu. That's a lot of uh, that's a lot of omelet right there. Funny enough, one, funny enough one egg can actually make an omelet to feed up to four I mean, I've people. Had ostrich omelets. Those things are huge. Yeah, it uh, was a monster. Yeah, this one four people can eat one emu omelet. And emu are like people do eat emu. Yeah. No surprise on that one. I mean, it's a big bird. You can mm. deep fry it. After the eggs are laid, the female emu, she'll just get up and leave. Like, full on mommy issues immediately starting. The f- the male, the male emu will incubate the eggs. And he'll just sit there. He won't eat. He won't drink. He won't even go to the bathroom while he's doing this. Jesus. The only That's time the only time he will stand is it's if it's to turn the eggs. That's it. That's the only time. How long do they incubate for? Get into that. He'll subsist on his stored body fat and whatever morning dew that he can get, he can drink from stretching his neck out. About a third of his overall body weight will be lost for this 8 week period. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Eight weeks. <clears throat> now, I'm but, laying down now. Tony is laying down on the floor. Because that wall is not very comfortable. Baby emus are striped and pretty cute looking. Like most yes. baby animals. They, yeah. Well, yeah. All baby animals. Well, most almost, of them. Almost all baby animals are cute. Most of them are pretty fucking cute. And baby emus, they're pretty cute looking. Just... Me, 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 me. Yeah, they look like... Those look like little baby raptors. Like, Big time. Like, uh, yeah. And I'll say this. Don't wear shiny stuff like buttons or uh, belt buckles around emus because they love shiny stuff. They will just start start trying to eat it. Oh, look at that. That's shiny. I think I'm going to take that. <laughs> One final fact before we get into the, emu the war. war. Uh, the emu is the unofficial official national bird of Australia, and it appears on Australia's coat of arms. The unofficial official. I had to look this up because there are official birds, national birds for different countries, and Australia doesn't have an official, like it is not written into legislation. Oh, like, okay, like, so. Like how we have the uh, bald eagle. Yeah, or the scissor tail if we're going local. If we're going local for Oklahoma, yes. Now, theirs is, um, it's unofficial because the emu was just selected since it's such a very, obvious, it's a very um clear I'm gonna bird. Guess, I'm going to guess because it won the war. <laughs> my bet, honestly, my bet, 20, how many? 20,000 emus? 20, yeah. Yeah, 20, no, 000. emus won. I don't care how many Australians with guns were involved. Nah, that you can't fight a fucking terror bird. Yeah, no, this is essentially like if we if the US were to go to war against bald eagles, in terms of like the national bird situation. <laughs> the so many confused Americans. <laughs> Very. <laughs> so now that we know a little bit more about our enemy, it's off to war we go. Oh god. 
Back to October 1932. The emus are beginning to invade the wheat belt. Mostly due to... Mostly due to... A couple of things. One, a drought had been going on, so they're looking for looking for uh, yeah, they're know, looking for food and water. To, yeah, and eat. two, it had been mating season. Oh, and as I as we yeah, mentioned, emus definitely won. Emus, they know how to do their thing, so <laughs> they were coming back to the wheat belt, and yeah, there's twenty thousand of them. Aus- they know how. <laughs> Australian farmers had essentially made an oasis for these guys. They would eat crops and destroy fences. That were initially built to keep out rabbits. So now we what have. What is a... going on in Australia? I didn't even it's know Aust- they had rabbits. Yes, like... some some rabbits were introduced and became, and rabbits uh, know how to breed like fuck. So, <laughs> so yeah, a lot of rabbits are running around out there, and they have to get cold on the occasion. Are the rabbits venomous too? <laughs> it, it it wouldn't put it wouldn't put it past Australia to have venomous rodents. I've never seen an episode of the Crocodile Hunter, rest in peace, where he was like, "Crocky, that's a white tail. I'm gonna go rub its foot for good luck." <laughs> now we have a conspiracy of emus and rabbits running around. The rabbits just needed the mu- of what. Are emu- they called conspiracy? Is that, is that like the murder of crows? Are they a conspiracy of emus? No, a group of emus is called a mob. I'm more combining the rabbits and the emus to be a conspiracy because the rabbits. I like they conspiracy more. <laughs> I like that more. Because rabbits, they couldn't get into the, they couldn't get past the fences. But these emus could. Just, they had the muscle, so yeah. it, literally so, yeah. tear them, tear down the fence. Yep, Mr. Gorbachev. <laughs> Farmers, uh, they weren't too happy about this. Shocker. Oh. And so some ex-soldiers, they went to talk to Sir George Pierce, Minister of Defense. Not a bird specialist or scientists and engineers. The actual Minister of Defense. I don't... Why? Why the, the DOD first? Or the MOD, I guess. They wanted to get this done. They were like, "This is ridiculous." I think it's because they didn't. I think it's because they did not have enough firepower, so to speak, of their own accor- of their own accord. Sounds like <clears throat> a problem America could solve real quick. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, they requ- these farmers again, who had been former soldiers. They requested the use of machine guns. I'm not kidding. So, spray and pray method. Spray and pray, yeah. Minister Pierce, uh, let me paint you what is what is going on in my head right now okay. for this. Okay, I'm 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 all ears. Go. Early morning rising over the dirt of Australia. <laughs> Side effects. And there's some poor Australian wheat farmer just looking out, drinking his, I don't, Foster's, I guess, out of a coffee mug. It's like, Karki, it's going to be a good day. Oh, shit. What's that? I don't know what that accent is. I'm not good at accents. <laughs> keep, keep going. <laughs> I'm loving this. And just over the horizon, there's dust coming up. There's a rumble in the air. And then Ride of the Valkyries comes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a horde, a conspiracy of of emus with rabbits on their backs riding, riding like, cavalry. Oh my god, I'm not, I can now visualize this, and it's not just, it's not just Ride of the Valkyries. It's the, it is, it's, I'm now thinking of, like, the orcs from Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Like, well, the no, rabbit. New Zealand. The ra- still the rabbits are the orcs, and you hear just the, 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 the tribal drums, the dun dun dun, and I'm- it's just their feet beating against drums. <laughs> Man, the Energizer rabbit really went feral. <laughs> and this poor farmer is just sitting there with his Fosters in a coffee mug, just ah oh, crikey. Ah, fuck. Someone get Dundee on the line! <laughs> Stereotypes. I'm I, so sorry. That visual 
I I love that visual so much. That's so terrifying. That's that's a, that's the, gonna be the shirt from this episode. Just a <laughs> rabbit on an emu <coughs> with like a battle machete. Oh my god, that's what uh, were we talking about? I oh just... yeah, machine guns. <laughs> Minister Pierce he agreed to this, but he had a stipulations. He said that only active military personnel would be allowed to handle these guns and that the farmers would have to provide accommodations, food, ammo, whatever for the military personnel assigned to this task. So it got taken seriously by the Minister of Defense. That's concerning. A cinematographer was also assigned... Oh God, there was someone recording it. We have to record it, yes! <laughs> He wanted to document the victory over the emus. Oh, that's not good. A brief aside, emu were considered a protected native species until 1922, when they were seen as vermin. And, yeah. They kind of have gone back and forth between protected species, vermin, just kind of depending on the time. 1999, they were officially made a protected species in Australia. For now. <laughs> Emu War 2027. <clears throat> now, can you guess how big the army would be to combat the emu forces? I don't think you'll get this one. It's either a stupid low number because they were like, ah, one machine's gonna, 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 you know, wipe out all of them, or it's a stupid high number. There's no in between. I'm gonna say like, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go stupid low and say like seven guys in a jeep. Three guys. Three guys. <laughs> you were you were not far off. How did they pick those three guys? Did they just pick I think they were so I think they were just selected. I so I feel like I I just I gotta put this one out in the air too. I okay. feel like they picked the three guys that were forced to do the latrine work that week and they're like hey toilets are fine go kill some emus <laughs> I, I feel like they picked <clears throat> the the bad batch to put for lack of a better phrase ba okay that's a potentially i'm not for certain under under <clears throat> the command of major Gwynedd Purvis Winnie Aubrey Meredith of the Royal Australian Artillery's 7th Heavy Artillery. That's this guy. This guy has the title. That guy was not a latrine cleaner. Nope. No. <laughs> there were also soldiers Sergeant McMurray and Gunner O'Halloran. <laughs> Got him. Hey, McMurray, what are you doing today? I'm just going to give me some emus. Go and get, go and get some emus and head down to Keiko Slater. <laughs> Gonna go ahead and head up to, to Quebec after Quebec. this. <laughs> and then Gunner O'Halloran. Now it's Gunner J. O'Halloran, by the way, to say that's not his name. That was his rank. The army, if you want to call it that, was yeah, equ sure. <laughs> was equipped with two Lewis guns, which I'm sending you a photo of. Oh, and, I know what Lewis guns do. And like 10,000 rounds of ammunition. I, um, um. Now, to some of our listeners who are unfamiliar with Lewis guns, I do have uh, some brief stats on them because, you know. So basically, any... <clears throat> oh, you do the specifics, I'll paint the picture. Yeah. Any World War One era or based movie, it is the machine gun you see in the trenches... With the big, or the big Chicago typewriter style magazine, a, a pay but magazine on top. Yeah, the Lewis gun is a World War One light <clears throat> machine gun that was designed in the U.S., but it was mass produced in the U.K. and was used by British forces during World War One. It is gas operated with a long stroke gas piston and rotating open bolt. Capable of firing several different bullets, such as a uh, 303 British, 30-06 Springfields. Oh, my God. And uh, 
I can't. Know, I don't know how to properly say this. I'm just going to seven point ninety two uh, by fifty seven millimeter Mauser. Yeah, seven nine two. Seven nine twos, just to name a few of the different types of ammo that this thing could use. So not only does it fire big rounds, because I, I'm not. I don't know if we have a gun fan base on our podcast, but I think seven nine twos are are the rounds that AR-15s go. They're pretty big bullets. Like yeah, I looked that, up what, it's not a small round. <laughs> I looked up what these things look like. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Uh these guns are fifty point <clears throat> five inches in length with a barrel length of twenty six and a half inches. They're about four and a half inches wide and they weigh twenty eight pounds. That's not terrible, honestly. Like it could be worse. They have an effective firing range of eight hundred and eighty yards okay. with a max of 3,500 yards. All right. And they normally use either a 47 or a 97 round pan magazine, which is that round yeah, on the, the top. Yeah, the Chicago typewriter ups mm -hmm. on the top. By late October 1932, the Emu Task Force, uh, yeah, they were ready to kick some ass, but heavy rains caused the birds to scatter, thus delaying the fight. You can't take this seriously. No, I can't. <laughs> now I'm thinking of Helm's Deep scene where the rain's coming down on the orcs and the emus are just standing there just menacingly and these three poor, poor souls are sitting in, I don't know, a jeep or something. They're like in their poncho gear just, ah, fuck. <laughs> November second. A lot of amazing imagery for this episode. I'm just saying. You are you're you're killing it right now. I'm loving this. November second, 1932. The war between the emus and humans officially begins. When Gandalf rode in from Mohir. <laughs> you're letting your nerd card fly this episode. I it's love a little it. Bit. The enemy, the enemy. Wrong word. I mean, not really. No, no. The army. That's what oh. I was meant to say was tasked with collecting 100 emu skins. With 10,000... The feathers from emus are used to help make uh, hats for light horsemen. So like a cavalry and That's mounted fair. infantry. But so. still, 10,000 rounds and you want only 100? This is only according to a newspaper at the time. Also, when I hear that uh, 100, 100 emu skins makes me think of Inglorious Bastards. Just, I'm, I'm hearing Brad Pitt say that. 100 emu scans! <laughs> yeah. Alright. And the army moved to Campion, <clears throat> which is a now abandoned town site in the Wheat Belt. Here, the army spotted 50 emu just, you know, doing emu things. I would, I would you know? Do that noise again. <laughs> you know, eating wheat, playing cards, tossing darts, smoking cigarettes, beating the drums. The the army. <laughs> <laughs> Throw you off for a minute there. You know how it is, though. Like, emu stuff. Emu things. These 50 emu were out of range of the Lewis guns. So, lo so get closer. Local farmers and settlers tried to help herd the emus. Get him closer. But the emus just ran off in different directions. Who'd have thought that things that were... Who'd have thought fast, ungainly birds with little heads for targets would be difficult to hit? This is becoming a mix of Lord of the Rings and the Far Side cartoons. <laughs> with a mix of Benny Hill. <laughs> it's, it's about to get... It's, okay. I told you it was going to get Looney Tunes, dude. I told you it was going to get Looney Tunes. The first attempts at firing the Lewis guns were unsuccessful, but the second volley of bullets seemed to kill a few emus. No number is given. Maybe five emus were killed out of the 50 in this little group. Wait, no, wait, no. What? What were the numbers again? Run that by me again. There were, fi there were they came across 50 emu just okay. outside of Campion. 50. And they didn't give numbers. They said, a few of them are dead. So, you know, five, six. Yeah. Not very impressive already. I am... so disappointed. 
with these. I at the this is not boding well. I don't feel like I'm gonna be. Oh God! Continue. The oh my God. The emus. The emus lost the battle of Campion and retreated. Mm, I don't know if they really <laughs> lost. I couldn't. I resi- don't feel like I they had lost. to use something. They ran on instinct and you know get away from the guns because I mean you're getting shot at. Like what are you gonna do? Well, they're emus and they're Australian, so charge straight at the guns and mm. murder. They're also that the, would be my thought. They're also pea brained, so you got to think about You're that. Pea-brained. Oh, shut up. <laughs> a few hours later, a smaller mob of emus was found, and quote unquote, perhaps a dozen are killed. So, best standing so far: twenty thousand emus. 20 dead. We'll say 20. We'll give benefit of the doubt, say 20 dead. Yeah. Okay. Progress. Uh, that's... Mm, it's those not, are words. It's those not very words. good. Not very good. Two days later. Two days later, November 4th. Major Meredith sets up an ambush point near a dam. They waited for a moment. The army spots roughly 1,000 emu coming to the dam where the water is, so... The gunners <clears throat> waited until the birds were closer before they opened fire. Unfortunately, the gun jammed, and only 12 emus were killed. No. <laughs> 12 emus were killed. They only had one of the Lewis guns this time. They didn't have both of them, just one. Why would... <clears throat> the rest of the 988 emus ran off, and no more birds were seen that day. Okay, so we're up, we're up to 32 emus. Tony has his calculator out. He's actually he's actually doing the numbers. <laughs> I forgot how to so it divided by No, it's minus. Minus Yeah, but I want a percentage. I want a percentage at the end of this. I want a kill death ratio like Call <laughs> of Duty. Oh, it's when I give you more of the numbers, it's going to be it's going to be disappointing. All right, I, so we're down to 19,968, give or take. Huh. What is su- now? This would not be a surprise to you, but the Australian newspaper was having some fun with all this. No, it's this is a quote from the Sunday Herald, July fifth, nineteen fifty five, when it was revisiting uh, the Emu War story. Oh. <clears throat> During these days, apparently, the emus began to improve their own understanding of the science of warfare for the, con- for the confused army observer on the fourth day, sadly admitted that each pack seems to have its own leader now, a big black-plumed bird which stands fully six feet high and keeps watch while the mates carry out their work of destruction and warns them of our approach. <laughs> they're evolving they're learning clever girl <laughs> I, I, the way they're going it's probably another couple days I imagine these hearing the outlandish outback stories were what Aussies did need after dealing with World War I the, pan, the flu pandemic and the great depression for the past couple decades and now we're on to an emu war that you're losing I think this was a laugh that they needed. I and would hope. I would be. I would be wanting to read the papers just to go. What's going on here today? All right, and they just got past Campion, and uh, oh, that's not good. Oh, the emus are moving in. Ah, oh, shite. Then again, who could afford a newspaper back in the day during the Great Depression? <laughs> Getting a little too real there. Getting a little too real there, Tim. Real. Oh God. Careful. Cords. Mind your cords. So many cords. To a. Tony's once again, man, the I'm ASMR. On the, floor again. the ASMR it's in fine. this episode's fun. It's fine. It's great. Everything's good. <laughs> to assist with trying to be more effective killing the emus, Major Meredith put one of the Lewis guns on the back of a truck. This should work, right? They didn't do that to begin with. <laughs> I thought that's what they were doing. I thought they mounted them and just were driving around just pot shotting them. Now, they've been, like, setting... Like, would, they would drive to locations and set the guns up trench style. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, Western Australia terrain is rough and uneven. Uh, 
which caused the truck to not travel more than maybe 20 or so miles an hour. The emus are running at 30 miles an hour. The guns were also difficult to fire in the bouncing car. This is beginning to sound like a third grade math problem. <laughs> if the emu travels at 30 miles an hour... And I'm gonna... I am... I'm not stealing this joke. I am actually just retelling it because it is a funny thought that... You said Benny Hill, right? Yes. Well, yes, I, I, I listen. I listen to Dan Cummins' podcast, Time Suck. And he talked about this... And I was use I did use some of this to help me out here. I also looked for my own sources and found the news articles and everything. He talks about how he can hear the Benny Hill theme going on as you know the gunner is in the back trying on the, in the bouncing truck trying to shoot, and the emu just comes up all nonchalantly and then just meep meep and runs off. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting the meet meep. Oh yeah, no, just meep meep and zooms off. So all I'm think all I can picture is like a a trio of Australians in And then this because is... they're in the desert, they're gonna be in jungle camo for some reason. So like dark greens. I'll and s- then I'll say this, the truck is not like uh it it looks like an old timey uh looks like an old timey car so to speak like yeah not, like a thirties truck like a thirties truck yeah. not like our truck not like their, our modern trucks well still this is what I'm picturing in my mind because Go on. in my head this is happening in the in the modern era okay okay so there's t- a trio of Australian commandos uh huh in jungle fatigues in the middle of the desert in a Toyota Hilux. With a machine gun that is mounted on the back with like duct tape in a in a oh god I have one at my house for my camera tripod a tripod Jesus you're welcome and they're chasing an emu across the desert bumping up and down spilling their fosters and the guy in the pickup bed with the gun is just going like this. <laughs> Tony is doing wild gesticulations, like, as if he's in a very bumpy Excuse road. Excuse me, what I do in my own time is my own business, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Oklahoma Education, for <laughs> failure of for failure of phonics and English. You're phonics. <laughs> One emu was killed, but because it got hit by the truck... And its head wound up getting stuck in the steering wheel, which caused the driver to lose control of the truck. I'm done. Hit, I'm going home. This thing. is not real now. This is an SNL skit. <laughs> Where is Pete Davidson? Is he hosting tonight? What's going on? <laughs> November 8th. Major Meredith was beginning to take stock of what had been going on. <laughs> they had fi- yeah. they had fired off about 2,500 rounds of ammo, and 50 emu were dead. The farmers said that Meredith and his men had killed, you know, hundreds of emus, but that's still not enough compared to the initial 20,000 they all had to deal with. Pretty sure Legolas and Gimli had killed more orcs by now. That counts as one. Yeah, the one that drove into the truck. <laughs> <laughs> that counts as one. Yeah, well, kind of a loss here because our truck's messed it, up. In his report, Meredith did say that his team took no casualties. I would hope not. <laughs> You're in a vehicle. Uh, I. Here is you know what I would I honestly wouldn't be shocked if they were like, Yeah, we had four guys killed. We only took three out. I know. It's weird. Here's here's an I found an ornithologist. Which is a bird expert for those unfamiliar. Uh his name is Dominic Cerventi. Okay. Uh he's he's one of the eminent he's one of the preeminent ornithologists of Australia. He said the machine gunner's dream of point-blank fire into serried masses of emus was soon dissipated. 
The emu command had evidently ordered guerrilla tactics, oh and its unwieldy <laughs> army soon split up into innumerable small units that made use of the military equipment uneconomic. A crestfallen field force therefore withdrew from the combat area after about a month. That is the mo. Is that man prior military? Because that's the most military description of. Yeah, we suck at this. Now the di- this is just the ornithologist. I think he was having some fun at the military. I, I, n- I didn't look into him further. That is, I want that on my wall. That's like inspirationally good. <laughs> at how? Oh my god. Also, on November 8th, the Australian House of Representatives began to question the operation. Oh, great. Now the government's fully involved. Especially after the dismal results and bad press. I don't know. It's pretty good press. Minister Pierce ordered the army to withdraw. So, you know, cue Monty Python. Run away! Hang on a second. Give you a second. You... You mean to tell me three grown ass men with two very, very well done weapons. Yes. And a truck. <laughs> Are you telling me we won't they that not we that these guys lost the war? Yes. It would seem the emus have won. Give Tony a second here to process. I need a drink. I very. I need. I. Mm. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna lie down now. And for it a has. And it hasn't even been a week yet. They started this November second. It's November eighth. They're like, yeah, we're done. This. <laughs> this November. This no. This particular November in 1932 was a hot one for Western Australia. So, it was a, still a severe drought, and more emu came in to eat up more wheat and drink from whatever water source they could find. So, we're not really through yet. Oh my god, that's not done. Farmers once again turned to the government with the Premier of Western Australia, sort of like their governor, uh, James Mitchell, going along with the farmers' play, uh, pleas and plans. After some strings were pulled by the Minister of Defense, the war was back on. The emus got reinforcements. Rabbits? No, they they got more emus. Like oh, yeah. The, the 20 that they... Well, <coughs> you the know. 50. Mm. Hmm. I don't believe that. <laughs> I don't believe that at all. There's never been any official numbers is the thing. So. Yeah, because they're probably too embarrassed to say, yeah, it was like three of them. <laughs> That is going to be a bigger secret than Area 51. Is how many guys, how many emus did you guys kill in the Great Emu War? Oh, like a couple of hundred thousand, or you know, there was only twenty thousand. Well, it was probably like five. Also, what? also, guess who's back? No, they Ma- did not bring those three guys back. Major Meredith and his team were back. They were brought back to finish the fight. What fight? They no. This time, things seem to be going better with reports of 100 emus a week being eradicated. No. After roughly no. after roughly another month, on December 10th, 1932, Meredith was recalled and he gave his report. He claimed 986 kills with 9,860 rounds of ammo used. That's like 10 rounds of ammo per one emu. And an additional 2,500 injured emu dying of their wounds. May not have been killed today, but they'll die tomorrow. I just... (laughs) I'm so disappointed right now. Uh, It's... It's so... And and emus, you... Like, the emus, they had... Some of them had took, like, five bullets to get taken down just by hitting their body. Their head... Which was the target to really, you know, get rid of them? Such a small ass head. Hell, if I'm not mistaken, the Minister of Defense, George Pierce, said 
Oh, I think it'll be good target practice for the boys. <clears throat> Instead of having actual people who knew how to fire the guns on moving targets. I was going to say, get your sharpshooters out with... I... I think they thought this was... I'm all for the spray and pray method in certain <laughs> situations, but if you're... If, if, if you lost the war once already... I don't... Maybe th change up the tactics. Yeah. News has now spread to other parts of the globe about the emu war. Oh, that's not good. It has met with both humor and criticism. Shocker. <laughs> the UN's just like a middle school cafeteria. Hey, Australia, what's going on with those emus, man? Shut up! <laughs> Conservationists, mostly from the UK, felt that this would be an extermination of the rare emu. Rare? <laughs> It's kind of easy to say that when your crops aren't getting eaten up by giant dino birds and rabbits. That have now teamed up and have made some unholy army under the guise of Sauron. <laughs> Dominic Cerventi, Hubert Whittle, and a couple other ornithologists thought that this was an attempt at the mass destruction of the birds. It's exactly what it was. It was an attempt. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> The farmers, <laughs> farmers would continue to ask for aid and military assistance against the emus in 1934, 1943, and 1948. But each time, they'd be refused. Instead, to combat this, the government, the Australian government, <clears throat> set up a bounty system against the emus. This proved way better than sending in military men, as there were over... 57,000 bounties collected in six months in 1934 alone. Jesus. It was all the former military guys want more money for their farms that they didn't get to pick. And they finally got it. That, that would do it. <clears throat> Despite that number, though, the emus were still going at it like rabbits with a large population still. I mean, With the rabbits. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> That's a terrifying thought. Oh, God, dude. Oh, God. An emu-rabbit hybrid. Ubit. Ew. Emubit. Or remu. It's Either just, way, it sounds terrible. It's just, it's just, it's just... It's terrifying. An emu with, like, fake Easter rabbit ears that you put on I was kids. I was thinking of either it's an emu with weird rabbit legs or it's a giant rabbit-sized emu with emu legs. A giant rabbit-sized emu. Swap those emu-sized rabbit with emu legs. That's terrifying. No, it's just an emu with, like, fake plastic <laughs> rabbit ears on its head. That's the only difference. Do you want to know the only thing that finally stopped the emus? Clearly wasn't humans. Better barrier fences. Pest exclusion... I'm, I'm not going to get political... Pest exclusion fences. I know, I know. I know. Seawalls are effective! <laughs> the These fences would also keep out dingoes and rabbits. Which is kind of how they how they're supposed to work. Keep things out of the farmlands. That is how fences do. Yep, that's how fences do. I mentioned this earlier, but in 1999... The emu was officially made a protected species in Australia once again. In the wild, there are between 625,000 to 725,000 emu still running around Australia. On the extinction scale, between, you know, very common to extinct, they're about least concern, so yeah. They're not too bad, but <clears throat> if they but if like Yeah, they're in the yeah, well yeah, they're in the yellow. Give or take. Because isn't it like green, yellow, orange, red? Yeah. Red so is being either is criti or almost... critical or extinct. Yeah. I think extinction black, actually. Like just Yeah. <clears throat> uh, but smaller local populations are... It, they're feared that they're going to be dying off due to illegal hunting, habitat loss, and even getting hit by cars. Clearly, it didn't but matter to that one emu. <laughs> so, in the end, the emus won the Great Emu War, and that's the story, Tony.
quintessentially Australian and just a bizarre one another one of my bizarre history takes. <laughs> what if the cassowaries had gotten involved, man? There would have been deaths on the human side. Oh yeah, no, cassowaries are vicious. Cassowaries are shorter and angrier. They're me. As a bird. Who the fuck is a moa then? Yeah, but then who's the emu? I'm looking at you. Yeah, I know, but then you have a small, medium, large. Who's the medium then? I don't know. There's don't... only a tall and a short. There's not a tall, short, medium. We don't have a tall, medium, short. That wouldn't make any sense. You mean a small, medium? A medium. A medium. <laughs> <laughs> a mall. An an extra medium. Extra medium. Yeah, an extra medium. <laughs> oh god. So This is a weird episode. Ah uh, yeah. I I like to hype some of my episodes up because I know they're gonna get weird. I told you this would be Looney Tunes, Tony. I just don't Were they getting stuff directly from Acme or was the or was Coyote like you know Coyote us? Coyote is focused on the Roadrunner. I don't think they could get enough from Acme. I just did they even try Acme stuff? Like, I feel like that might have worked better. Maybe. You know, I actually find it funny. But this that's the humor of it. The word Acme. We have it now synonymous with failure, right? Mm -hmm. The initial word Acme actually means the pinnacle, the best. So when they would all fail in the Looney Tunes cartoons, that was the joke. Because they're supposed to be the best. In hindsight... There's a lot of stuff that the Looney Tunes did that was like, oh shit, that's a nice dig. Oh yeah. Like, that... like the Acme stuff. There was another one I remember reading about. Um, It was Bugs Bunny's, not his cats, not What's Up Doc, but something else he used to say a Albuquerque? lot. Albuquerque? No, not Albuquerque. There was some other thing he used to say a lot that made fun of Elmer Fudd. And it used oh, to... Oh, Nimrod. Nimrod. Yes. yes. That used to be like a pinnacle of like intelligence. No, no, Nimrod. What Nimrod was a mighty hunter in the Bible. Yes, a he Nimrod. was a hunter, yeah. and because of the way that it was connotated back then, it's now an idiot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Looney Tunes be changing the world. Oh yeah, no hell, Bugs Bunny, same thing. Like it's like uh, we associate him with carrots and everything. Uh, carrots are actually bad for rabbits, apparently. Yeah. They Real like, life uh, berries and blueberries and cherries and. Stuff like that. And it was actually because I think it was Clark Gable, pretty man of the pretty man of the golden age of Hollywood, would eat carrots and they were like, Let's let's uh, emulate that. Yeah. I could be wrong on who it was, but anyway. Sounds about right though. <laughs> uh, so where do you where do you have for us uh uh for next episode, Tony? Well, not Australia, because, you know, the emus rule over that area now. Yeah. Um I was thinking we we uh we chill out on some stuff and we talk about uh talk about some Brendan Fraser stuff, kind of. A uh oh. Bit. I might have an idea, but I'll let you. I'll let uh yeah. let us figure that out as we get there. Yeah. Once again, everybody, we hope you all enjoyed listening to this very weird piece of Australian history. And if you're an Australian listener, if you know if the accents were crap. Sorry, we're Americans. Just we we don't know any better. Yeah, you we're, guys got taken over by emus. You don't have no. Shut up. We're trying to get better. I'm trying to get better at least. I'm not. <laughs> you got taken over by emus. Uh, logo once again by my friend Brittany Norris. If you want to follow us on social medias, we are on Facebook and Instagram at Tall and Short Podcast. You can also email us at Tall and Short Pod at Gmail dot com. Once again, this has been Tall and Short with Tim and Tony. So thank you all for watching. Don't get in... Thank you all for listening, not watching. Don't get involved with... Don't get involved in a war fight with... In a land war with uh, emus. Is that how that line goes? It's in a land war in uh, Asia. All hail the emu kings! <laughs> and everybody, have a good one. Bye!